Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. Uh, what a glorious day. And uh, this day we will celebrate uh, Christmas in a manner in which uh, four of the pastors here, uh, myself, Pastor Craig, Pastor Jim, and Pastor Lewis, will share a, a story or insights uh, regarding Christmas Day. We'll have some carols in between. And um, we just hope that truly your day is a blessed day, a day in which the birth of our Lord and our Savior um, touches you in such a way that it strikes a chord within you in which you know the promises of God for you are sure and true and that God indeed has touched you and blessed you with his very eternal and Holy Spirit. And we ask that as, as we consider this day and celebrate this day um, that you be mindful of those around you who may perhaps not be gathering with family and friends, but certainly do carry that spirit, that Christmas spirit about them. Um, and so with that, um, our service will begin as we hear the Christmas story. We hear the Christmas story this Christmas day as it comes to us from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. And we'll read the first 20 verses from... Luke's accounting. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in the bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Well, today is Christmas Day. And we're um, working on trying to figure out and think about um, those Christmas memories. That memory that just, that so comes to mind in my life when I think about Christmas. And I was trying because there are so many. There are so many that, that I, I know, some I've preached, some I've said, some I've written about. And so I was trying to think of that of that other memory, a memory that, that is part of what I am and who I have become as a child of God and what's influenced me. And some of you are going to laugh, I know, but, I, but, but what, what struck me as I kept going back in my mind about the memories of Christmas that I have, there seemed to be one common thread. Christmas trees. Christmas trees. 
Now, now, now don't, don't laugh too much, and I'm going to try to talk fast because it's one of those things of where everything that I think about as Christmas, every memory that I have is connected with a silly Christmas tree. I mean, to the point of where when I was a little kid, and I'm talking in that four-year-old, three-year-old time where, where I've heard the stories of where when I was first born, that, that mom put the Christmas tree in my playpen so that I couldn't get to it. Okay? That's where she put the Christmas tree. She didn't put me in the playpen. She put the Christmas tree and all the presents in the playpen so I couldn't get them. And I think about that, and I think about all the years of literally going and buying our Christmas tree. And I remember going in a remodeled gas station when it was 20 below, and here we were buying a Christmas tree and dragging it on the car to get it back home. I remember going into the wise men's tent and getting that Christmas tree and with my dad, and he came home with it, and mom just went, oh, you spent that much on a tree? But it went up in the house. And I remember as a kid thinking about now, if we move the Christmas tree away from the heat register, will it burn it out faster, dry it out faster? And it was my job because I was little to water that Christmas tree every single time. As I grew up, I remembered those wonderful Christmas ornaments that, and I, that were up in the attic. And I remember that first time where mom let me go up the ladder to go get those Christmas ornaments and set them down because most of the time, mom, when we were younger, she would just decorate the tree and we would come home and it all be done. But that first time of decorating. And I remember, I remember so vividly that we were able to take and do garland and put those ornaments and those special things on the tree. And that made the Christmas. It, the smell was amazing. And one of the things that as I grew up and I realized that that was so much a part of my Christmas, that idea of tree, I have to laugh because my one true Christmas that we didn't know if we were going to get a tree was in that wonderful Los Angeles doing internship because we knew those Christmas trees were so expensive because being in Southern California, yeah, so we ended up going to Target for something and we said, oh my gosh, they've got Christmas trees, yes. We had a $4.97 Christmas tree, but we had a Christmas tree. When Suzanne and I first got together, it was right before we were married, and I had a nine-foot Christmas tree, and I knew Suzanne loved Christmas. She had told me about all her ornaments. And so when we moved in, I had a nine-foot Christmas tree. I asked Suzanne, I said, and I remember the words so well. I said, do you think all of your ornaments would fit on that tree 16 years ago? And she looked at that nine-foot tree, and I could tell I was in trouble. And sure enough, that, that I literally did then when we moved into our house, we kept all the Christmas stuff to the side. And my only goal for the Christmas of 2006 was to have all of Suzanne's ornaments that had meant so much to her that she had not seen for years because they had been in storage and hardly ever in one place at one time I wanted to make, give her that gift. And sure enough, they all fit. They all fit. When I come to Mount Zion in the new building, again, I was thinking Christmas. And so, for the Christmas of 2007, I knew this was going to be the spot where the Christmas tree was going to go. Because it's that important of a place and such important in my memory and my mind. Well, over the last 16 years, Suzanne and I, our Christmas has gotten a little bit bigger. And we, we, when we moved into our house a couple years ago, excuse me, when we moved into our house, I always dreamt of that 12-foot Christmas tree. So last year, we put a 12-foot Christmas tree in our front room and decorated it. 
And even now at our second Christmas of that, I marvel, I marvel at the blessings that each one of those ornaments represents in my life. For you see, it's just not the bulbs. It's not just the garland and the lights. It's the memories. On my Christmas tree is one ornament. It is the most precious ornament that I have. It's about this big. It's made out of plaster of Paris that I did in first grade. I remember pouring it. I remember coloring it. And I remember putting the glitter on it and hanging it on that tree growing up. And you know what that ornament's about and what that is? It's of a Christmas tree. I can't imagine Christmas without having that symbol of life. I can't imagine my Christmas without hanging those memories on the branches. And I'm so glad that I have Suzanne, who loves Christmas as much as I do. May you have a blessed day as you're able to remember and make memories of your Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. My name is Lewis Liss, and I'd like to read to you today from Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. The Gospel reads, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. So he took up the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. I love Christmas. I love Christmas time. It's such a wonderful time for us to spend with each other rejoicing no matter how hard the year was no matter what challenges we faced we get to be with each other and celebrate with one another the birth of the savior and a reminder that peace came to the earth and the kingdom of the lord is here now the thing is is that that's not necessarily the case for everyone including for <laughs> jesus himself 
uh, right after he was born in a manger, substandard conditions, not necessarily around loved ones, family, and friends. He had to flee. His um, father and mother took him quickly to Egypt, to a foreign land, and they stayed there for six years waiting until Herod died. And so for some people, Christmas is not as enjoyable as for others. It reminds me of a time when I was growing up, I was young and uh, had just become a Christian. And I was just getting used to what Christmas was. It wasn't until I was 16 that I even learned that Christmas was on December 25th. Um, and so I was trying to figure out what Christmas culture was, what Christmas traditions were. And about two years after I got saved, something strange happened in our church. We had several members who were amazing, strong pillars of faith in the community. And one of them was a man named John Prince. And he was an amazing man of God. The way he prayed, the way he worshiped, the way he loved the Lord and loved others was a model for me and for everybody else in the congregation. And early December, without any warning, without any understanding of what was going on, he passed away in his sleep. And it put a cloud on the whole season. We were trying to prepare funeral preparations and get everything ready and help his wife. And um, it was supposed to be a time of celebration, I thought, of joy. And as we walked into service on Christmas Eve, I was wondering how our pastor was going to deal with this issue when everybody was supposed to be happy and celebrating and singing joy to the world. And yet there was this cloud that was heavy over the whole congregation. And so during that time, um, he gave a sermon my pastor did. And he said, for most of us, Christmas is a wonderful time of celebration, of family, of friends, of joy, where we get to be together. But for some of us, that's not. And if your Christmas is full of stress or hurt or even some loneliness, fear, anxiety, then your Christmas is much more like Jesus' Christmas. And even in that time of anxiety and fear and everything being not as sure as it's supposed to be, not being around people who love us and having to run off to a new place with the new people, new culture, new everything. The joy of the Lord was still there. The peace of the Lord was still there. The hope of the Lord was still there. And the angels still came to the shepherds and said, do not be afraid. For to us today, a child is born. And so whether your Christmas is filled with family and friends or it's not what you expected, the Lord is with us, even now, always, until the very end of the age. And it's important for us to share that with all of those around us, no matter what their Christmas situation is, that the Lord is with them too. Merry Christmas, and I pray for all of you a happy new year. child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our keeping this this is Christ the King whom shepherds
now pierce him through the cross he bore for me, for you. Hail, hail the word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. First off, I want to thank uh, all who, for this opportunity to share this story. It's a uh, there's so many stories to select from. I was having difficulty and I called my brother and my sister uh, just to think about the Christmases that we had as kids. And uh, my sister reminded me of a story. And I, I tried to blank this one out of my mind. Obviously, uh, I, I didn't want to remember this story. Uh, but um, my mom and dad, I must have been about nine, maybe, you know, probably eight or nine years old, which makes my sister about six or seven years old. My brother would have been uh, 10 or 11. Um, and, and my uh, parents went um, to one of my aunts and uncles for a sort of an adult uh, type of Christmas gathering. And so they left us home. And um, as, as good nine, ten-year-old uh, boys, um, I... I <laughs> Now, my, my, I, we, I don't recall these details. Like I said, I've tried to blank this out. But I, I think that how it unfolded was that my brother and I started um, uh, throwing pillows, the, the, the pillows from the couch at each other. And, um, of course, being 9, 10, 11-year-old boys, um, we weren't just, like, tossing them. I mean, like, rifling them. And we're starting to run around and we're rifling, hiding behind chairs and the couch and boom, boom. And we're throwing these pillows at each other. And sure enough, I, I'm, I, as I tried to blank this out, but I, and I may not be quite accurate about all that unfolds now, but I do recall um, rifling a pillow at my brother as he's heading in front of the Christmas tree. Ducks hits the Christmas tree, goes into the wall, knocks down a picture. The Christmas tree falls down. And we just stopped, like, uh-oh. And so we do our best to um, repair everything, put everything back the way it was. Um, I think there's a couple Christmas bulbs that broke. The picture was cracked. It, it, you know, and, and, and when my, my parents came home, my mom sort of noticed that, well, the Christmas tree wasn't looking quite the same when she left. And so um, she wondered what happened. And of course, um, we um, blamed my sister. Um, it was her fault. Uh, and um, we said that Elaine knocked down the Christmas tree. Um, and my mom wasn't quite believing it. And I said, no, we busted her. We busted her. Um, she was under there trying to figure out all the gifts. And she was under there. And me and Leonard walked in on her and surprised her. She jumped up and the Christmas tree fell over. That's what happened. Yeah, that's how it went. Yeah. And, and, and um, well, I don't know that my, my, my sister didn't blame us. Um, when I was talking to her on the phone the other night, she goes, yeah, well, you guys raised me not to snitch. That's, uh, snitches get stitches. And uh, so, yeah, um, so she never, uh, she took the brunt of it. Um, that's the kind of kids we were. Um, whoever got blamed took it, no matter what. Um, I think my mom knew, though, um, that my sister, who's like about 5'2 now, I, I, you know, at 6 or 7 years old, really, um, wasn't knocking down the Christmas tree. I, I'm pretty sure we all paid for it. Um, but it, it did remind me also that, that my, my sister um, is, is the type of, of child that she knew everybody's, not just her gifts before Christmas Day. She knew all of her gifts, which she knew what was in everybody's package. She knew what I was getting, my brother was getting. And she would even say, so what do you think's in that package over there? Huh, Danny, what's in that one? And I'd say, oh, I, it looks like a game. It's probably Candy Cane Lane. She goes, no, nope, that's not what it is. It starts with a D. It starts with a D. Think about that, huh? You know, because she knew. She knew all the gifts that were under there. She, you know, and, and I never seen her do it. But she used to, um, I guess, sneak in, untape a little bit, find out what it was and then tape it back up. Never seen her do it. 
never caught her doing it, um, but she knew everybody's gift beforehand. And she would tease us about it. I know what you're getting. I know what that is. I, and, and uh, you know, there are people like that. But also, when you hear that Christmas story, um, the shepherds knew the gift before they got there. They knew that the gift of the Savior was born. They knew it before they went and saw that wrapped child. They knew that wrapped child was, was the Savior, promised of Messiah of God. They knew it beforehand. And so it's one of those things that we do as um, God's people. So do we know the gift we know the gift before him. We know the gift before Christmas Day. We know. And yet it still surprises us. Each and every time we consider how this gift, the fullness of God's love and grace, the fullness of God's power and authority, the fullness of God dwells in an infant just is a complete surprise each and every time that the Lord would transform all of life and our lives in a manner as this infant, in this infant, through this infant, the gift that we know even before it's unwrapped. Have a very Merry Christmas. Precious Lord Jesus, lying in a manger, we pray to you this day that you continually bless us, strengthen us, nourish us, and Almighty Lord, as we share of our lives with our neighbors and friends and family, may we share you as you have indeed come into this world to share your eternal salvation with each one of us this day. We give thanks and praise. Amen. Merry Christmas to all of you. It's good to be back again. Today I've got a story for you about a time in my life where I was struggling a little bit and worrying about my, my understandings of God. I was nine years old and you know, that's about the perfect time for Christmas, isn't it? It's great. So, uh, I had my eyeballs focused firmly on a new, I think it was a John Hadel autographed signature football. Something way more expensive than my family could afford. My family was poor. But I had an ace in the hole. I had an uncle, a rich uncle as far as I was concerned. Rich meaning he had a couple of gas stations with his brother. But he always had cash and he always spent money on, it, on his nephews. So I worked it hard. And about a week, two weeks before Christmas, I discovered something horrible had happened. You see, he was working in the garage next to his station and he got in a hurry, so instead of doing it right, he grabbed a couple of bumper jacks and jacked up a car and crawled underneath it to get some work done. And you know what happened. While he was pulling on the wrenches and stuff, he managed to pull that car off those jacks. And it crushed him. It broke bones everywhere, took the breath right out of him. His brother ran in got him out from under the car, jacked it up and got him out, got him to the hospital. And for the next few days, I heard whisperings. You know, kids hear things around Christmas when the parents are whispering. And the whisperings I heard was, I don't know if he's even gonna make it. Well, a few more days later, it started to become Looks like he's going to make it, but he's never going to be the same.
and I kind of worried about my football. Well, Christmas Day came, and as usual, we had the big family blowout at my grandmother's house, as we did every year. And just before we sat down for our big Christmas dinner, my grandpa and one of the other uncles came in with my Uncle Galen on a chair. They had loaded him up and put him on a chair and carried him into the house on the chair, up the stairs so that he could get there, and they laid him out on the couch. He looked bad, really bad. And I didn't know what to think. And so all of us nieces and nephews kind of kept snuggling up closer and closer to that couch trying to figure it out. And he finally sat up a little bit, let me sit back next to him, and he put his arm around my shoulder and just sat there for a minute. And you could see a little tear on his cheek, knowing how much all of the kids really did love him and wanted him to do better. And in that moment, I realized what I really wanted for Christmas. What I really wanted was for God to fix him. Get him out there where he belongs, out in the backyard and snowball fights and building forts. Getting ready to take us places in the summertime to the lakes and to the swimming pools all over Iowa to the amusement parks and all of those things that he so loved to do, just please, God, fix him. And the football kind of went out, of, went out of sight. And it was right then, nine years old, that I learned that there's a big difference between the gifts under the tree and the gifts of God. And I started looking for them and I started seeing the gifts of God everywhere. In creation, in relationships, in friends, and family, in health. And it changed my life. Because you see, I wanted then to celebrate Christmas a little bit differently from then on. I wanted to celebrate not the gifts under the tree, I wanted to celebrate the gifts of God. All of them. Including the gift of His Son, which we celebrate today. And all that He's done. So my gift, my wish for you this Christmas day is that you have the time, take the time, to celebrate and contemplate the gifts of God during this Christmas season. Merry Christmas.
Chief.